Hi, everyone. It's Amy. As this year winds down through the rest of December, we are resharing a few of our favorite episodes from 2022. These were chosen to warm your souls and brighten your spirits, so we hope they'll keep you company on your travels, as you wrap gifts, or as you envision your dreams and aspirations for the new year. We'll be back at the top of January with brand new episodes and some exciting announcements. Until then, all of us here at Clever are sending you extra strength wishes for the most joyful season and the best 2023 you can possibly imagine. Cheers to you, and thanks for listening. That's the dream of what podcasting can be. It's almost like this pirate radio thing. I don't want it to get too professionalized. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to podcaster Avery Truffleman. You probably recognize that name. You will definitely recognize her voice. For seven years, until 2018, she worked alongside Roman Mars on 99% Invisible, the award-winning, trailblazing podcast about all the thought that goes into the things we don't think about, the unnoticed architecture and design that shape our world. First as an intern and then as a producer, Avery was right there in the recording closet of the architecture office in downtown beautiful Oakland, writing, recording, and editing powerful, illuminating stories about the power of design, both as the medium of podcasting blew up and as 99% Invisible itself climbed to global recognition. While there, under the banner of 99PI, Avery created Articles of Interest, a two-season mini-series about clothing that covers a broad range of concepts, including the rise of casual wear, the environmental impact of the textile industry, and why women's wear doesn't have pockets. It's fascinating. From there, she moved to Nice Try, a podcast from Curbed about utopian experiments that includes two seasons of deep dives into subjects like Jamestown, Virginia, and the backstory of the Crock-Pot. She's also done a stint, during the pandemic, I might add, as the host of The Cut, a weekly podcast about life and culture from New York Magazine. As you'll hear, it's been something of a wild ride, but one that also feels tailor-made for a distinctive voice like Avery's. Here she is. I'm Avery Truffleman. I live in Brooklyn and I'm a podcaster, which is like the most odious sentence in the world. <laughs> I do what I do because it's the way that I've come to see the world. I can't imagine myself doing anything else. Well, I can't imagine you doing anything else either. When I listen to your work, it really does feel like it's your calling. I think you found the right spot. Thank you. I do like to go all the way back to zero. And I understand that you may actually have radio baked into your very DNA. I do. I'm the luckiest. So my parents met working at WNYC. They loved it. And they talked about it all the time. And they were just working at WNYC in the 80s. Like Allen Ginsberg was always coming by. And my mom was head of classical recordings at WQXR and was like traveling around the world recording orchestras in Taiwan. I grew up seeing pictures of them with my mom's gigantic 80s hair and like beautiful chonky earrings and my dad wearing like his red Converse sneakers. I love my parents anyway. I'm very blessed to have super cool parents, but they just looked impossibly cool working in public radio. And they always talked about it. And they were like, it was the most fun job. And they talked about how much they loved cutting tape with a knife. And my mom was like, oh, you know, when you would lose a the, you're really screwed. It was a very different art back then. Yeah, like you would have to physically construct the yeah. conversation. Wow. Yeah. They both adored it. And I grew up with the radio on and the house all the time. Before podcasting was ever a thing, I was a huge radio fan and I got involved in college radio and always knew that radio was a part of my life and something I was really interested in. But I'm very blessed in that my parents from the get go were like, oh, that's a totally viable job being a radio producer. You go be a radio producer. And they're like, maybe you won't do it forever. Maybe you'll do it for a decade or so like we did, but it's so fun and you should definitely go do it. So they were always supportive and they always got what I wanted to do. 
That is truly lucky. So I have a very basic pop culture understanding of what it's like to work in radio, which is built around WKRP. It's an old sitcom. (laughs) But it sounds like the public radio life of WNYC was a, a little bit more anchored in that that's a station in and of itself that was making a lot of the zeitgeisty content that was so important in the day. And so that sounds like you could have a stable life and make radio if you were plugged into that kind of situation. I don't think it paid a lot, but I think, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know, like depending physically stable. Yes, it was in one building, but I don't know about the other forms of stability. It's so interesting, right? Hearing it be called content. The One of the reasons I fell in love with radio was the approach was just so different. It really felt like a public service. That's the thing I really adored. Gosh, I remember when 9-11 happened, my mom's first instinct, instead of turning on the TV, was she actually ran out to the car and turned on the radio, which is kind of ridiculous because there was a radio in our kitchen. Like, we had a radio. Just this idea that, you know, this is who is going to give you the most up-to-date news at any given time, and they're not relying on B-roll or what images they can get. You hear someone on the radio... You hear this in the old broadcast about the Hindenburg burning. It's like, this is what's happening right now. I can't believe it. Oh, my God. Or like, I'm trying to figure this out. And that was the thing that I really adored growing up listening to WNYC locally, but even NPR nationally and listening to the BBC. You know these voices and you know these names, but you don't really know what they look like. And it just felt so egoless. It felt like they were really public servants in this really cool way. I mean, it's part of why I chose to go to school where I did. It was because our radio station wasn't only a student radio station. It was because the radio station was actually an NPR affiliate and a community radio station. So I got to meet a lot of people who lived in the area who I definitely would not have met, you know, sequestered on a campus and feeling really engaged with the world. And I just loved the idea of listening to the Brian Lehrer show in the morning and having people call in and like describe what they see outside their window. It just felt very holy. I don't know, there's something very sacred about the fact that it's over the radio waves and everything has resonance and radio, even the stars have a sonic resonance. I was like, wow, (laughs) this is beautiful. And then of course, podcasting came along. You know, I have a lot of mixed feelings about it because it's definitely not a public service anymore. And sometimes I feel bad that I'm like, hey, 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 like, listen over here, look at me, you know, rather than like delivering something to a public by switching on a dial. But as podcast technology gets more intuitive and perhaps maybe more geolocated, I think there will be ways to integrate the best parts of radio back into the like ease and on demandness and freedom that podcasting affords. I'm looking forward to that. And I agree with you. I think just to counteract one thing that you just said, in any medium, podcasting or radio, there's a spectrum of like vanity project versus public service. (laughs) And I do think if you really are conscientiously and intentionally building an art form that you think is serving the public, it can have a touch of vanity, but also still be a public service. That's an interesting point. I think you're right. Like now you've got me thinking about like Howard Stern, which is obviously like a vanity project. But I mean, God, that guy was on air killing time for three hours, like occupying time almost as like this durational performance, which is also a service. (laughs) Agreed. And then, you know, there's Ira Glass. And I don't think that we could separate Ira Glass from this American life. And yet that show really paved the way for podcasting what it is today. And also set a new example of how we can expect to digest stories through the radio. Yeah. Okay, so back to you. I want to get to your campus radio station days. But before we get there, do you have any siblings? Or is it just you and your radio parents kind of doing the thing? I have a sister and she's the best. I'm obsessed with her. She's like my best friend. (laughs) Older or younger? Younger. We were not super close when I lived on the other side of the country. But now that we live a 15 minute walk from each other. And even last night, I just like happened to be in front of her door. And so I came up and I've never had the kind of friend where we can just drop in on each other unannounced. And now I have that with my sister. And it's funny, we grew up, you know, I'm the big one, she's the little one. But over time, the age difference fades. And now it's negligible. And we're basically the same age, you know, it's like we have a three year age difference, and it's nothing. And that's so nice, especially after two years of pandemic to be able to drop in on your sister, like, That's delicious. Say hi to your sister for me. (laughs) I 
I will. She's, <laughs> I'll probably see her super soon. <laughs> Okay, so big sister in the teenage years, did you feel like you needed to set an example or were you free to like rebel or did you just like have your nose buried in a book or like how did you express yourself in your teenage years? Oh man, I mean the way I expressed myself was through clothes. That was my number one way of expressing myself. I am not surprised. (laughs) Let's hear it. Well, it really showed me the importance of fashion. And you know, we actually like to descend into podcaster mode for a second. To understand that, first we have to go back in time. Like, it really... (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, you see this in the history of the oppressed. Not to align myself with the oppressed. I'm, like, very lucky and fine. But I think people who historically have felt powerless have had no other outlet but their own bodies. I mean, one of my favorite facts uh, in doing research for the show that I did on clothes called Articles of Interest was seeing how people who were enslaved in America, there was this huge history of indigo dye being a cash crop even before cotton on Southern plantations. Enslaved people would take some of the dye and like steal it themselves to draw patterns on their like horrendously itchy, uncomfortable, disgusting clothes that they were given. And people running away from slavery would actually sew themselves pockets into their pants as like a sign of autonomy. We see this in the history of women also. Like why were women who didn't have a way to make money or express themselves or declare who they were publicly have no choice but to show it through their clothes and how they dressed up and what color, you know, having a sense of style and a sense of taste was almost the only sense of control and power that they had. I felt as though I understood a tiny sliver of this being a teenager. You know, some kids pick up a guitar, some kids skateboard, and I went thrifting. And my aunt lived in San Francisco, which just had incredible thrift stores, and I grew up going there and just buying the weirdest poochie print mini dresses and like fringy cowboy jackets. I just loved it. And I would come back to New York with these bags full of clothes, my pride and joy every night as a teenager. Uh, Actually, as early as middle school was just laying out very weird, very interesting. They just felt like little experiments. Like that was my art. I remember loving the feeling of like, what can I get away with today? It was my main form of expression. It meant so, so, so much to me. And I am nowhere near as wild of a dresser. I mean, I miss that abandon. I think I'm more subdued now that I have other outlets. (laughs) Yes. Like now you would just kind of be questioned for your sanity. But like as a teenager, putting together the wildest outfit you can think of is, you know, sort of understood as you forging your adult identity. I think there's something to that, but I remember sort of boiling the lobster slowly, sartorially. Like, I remember the day that I decided to start dressing strange. And I remember I wore these big, huge, like, rainbow beaded earrings. And I was so scared to do it. I was like, these are so loud and they're so not me. And I remember people commented on them and teased me on them all day. And at the end of the school day, I threw them in the trash. I was so mortified by it. I was like, okay, I just have to get used to that. And the first couple of times, it's going to be really hard and uncomfortable. And I'm going to feel like everyone's staring at me. But then once it becomes standard, people will just understand that this is who I am. And so I think almost anyone, I mean, I guess I could decide to do that now if I wanted to. Once you build a sort of standard for how you present in the world, people get used to it. That's interesting. So you're almost like psyching yourself into it like yeah I don't know like reading your poetry in front of a crowd or singing a solo or something that's such a good way of putting it yeah it felt like a really gutsy thing and that was it really felt like a an art form and I was really nervous there can be a kind of knee-jerk reaction to somebody who's willing to dress loud that they're just a wild extrovert it can be very vulnerable to put yourself out there like that. Oh, totally, totally. You know, I've never thought about this before. It really did, almost like any other art form, it kind of gave people the right to comment on it, you know, and people would tell me if they liked what I was wearing or they thought it wasn't working. Or I remember one girl was like, how do you get away with it? Everything you're wearing totally clashes. And I looked down, I was like, oh my God, like none of these like quote unquote match at all. And then afterwards I got really into like, okay, what is matching? How can I coordinate colors? And it felt like I was inviting critique and sort of growing in this, in this interesting 
way that, yeah, also felt very vulnerable. And I remember feeling deeply embarrassed or shameful when I felt like I had a miss and people were telling me like, oh, what are you wearing today? It, it was kind of a, a funny experiment thinking back on it. I can see that. I, I remember one time somebody came up to me and said, you know, you realize your shoes don't go with what you're wearing. You look stupid. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, yeah, but I kind of made that choice. And also, why is this making you uncomfortable? Like, why do you care that my shoes don't match? Right. I thought about it and I recognized that somehow I was privileged in that I felt like I could take liberties huh. like that. What do you mean? Whoever was criticizing what I was wearing clearly felt like m more constricted. Otherwise, it wouldn't offend them. Yeah. I don't know if they would get in trouble or if like somebody in their family would look down upon them or they, you know, just wouldn't let them go out of the house like that or something. Right. But whatever offended the person who said that to me, that had to be a reflection of their own like lack of liberty, don't you think? Oh, totally. No, I think about this all the time that clothes are the literal barrier between our internal selves and the external world. It is actually how we physically navigate where we end and where the public begins. And so on the one hand, you are projecting out, you know, who you are. And on the other hand, you are responding to your circumstances, your culture, literally the weather, the time of day. You are balancing what's inside and what's outside all the time. And you can see how those forces come to bear. And it's very interesting when something that you wear can provoke a response in somebody else that yeah. really doesn't have anything to do with you. Totally. And yeah, my, my clothes really alienate. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was my clothes. I can't imagine what else it was, but I was definitely sort of a part. I, it is weird. Like, I wouldn't call myself unpopular. I didn't get, like, ridiculed. I got teased sometimes as much as the next kid, but I didn't get, like, invited to parties and stuff. Tom Wolfe describes himself often as, you know, the, the alien in the white suit in the corner. And I think I just dressed so weirdly apart and kind of intentionally so as my act of rebellion mm -hmm. that it just it didn't work. It didn't, it didn't fit. And so it was interesting. I was like, why am I being so alienated? I feel so bad. But then I just couldn't, I couldn't stop, you know? I couldn't <laughs> not do it. I was like, I I've come this far. Myself. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I think I was just like, I've trained this hard. <laughs> Totally. But I, I do think it's interesting when you're willing to take chances like that. It does separate you a little bit from the people who are maybe less willing to take those chances or less willing to sort of look past the differentness into why you might be taking those chances. I think there was like respect there. But I think clothes are such a powerful marker of identity, especially in a, in a place as conformist as a school. If you see someone who doesn't dress like you, like the, well, you're you sit at different lunch tables, you know? There are like, these unspoken social rules, too, exactly. about, like, what hairstyles are in fashion and what shoes are, like, on trend. And if you're completely ignoring those rules, then nobody else really knows where they stand with you because the hierarchy is, like, obliterated. Yeah, this amazing fashion writer who I adore called Derek Guy, he's amazing. He told me this thing that I think about all the time. And he said, when you put together an outfit, you're basically crafting a sentence and it has to make sense. And he pointed to what he was wearing and he was like, listen, I've got this like cowboyish Western motif going and you understand what I'm referencing and like what I'm pulling from and what my color schemes are. Even if you don't overtly get it, you sort of get it. You understand that everything is in concert and you understand who I am. If I were to show up in a purple dress with like an electric green feather boa and ski boots, <laughs> that would be a sentence that doesn't make sense. It's, and Noam Chomsky has this example of a grammatically correct sentence that makes no sense. And it's colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And he was like, if I m put together an outfit that made no sense, it would just be like yelling colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And it's not, you don't know what to do with it. So I also want to be fair. It's not like the other kids were like, whoa, she's so, you know, she's so wild. We don't even know what to do with her. I mean, I was yelling colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And in <laughs> fact, I was yelling so loud that it meant nothing. It wasn't sending any message, you know, it was actually lacking in substance. And so it makes sense that kids didn't know what to make of me because I didn't know what to make of me. I was just babbling, you know? That's interesting. That's really self-aware of you to 
even in hindsight, to sort of recognize that stage of your development. I mean, I definitely remember using fashion to kind of signal my alliance with punk rock. And, yeah. You and know, like, right. That's a style. Right. Yeah. I, w- I wasn't yelling a, a sentence that didn't make any sense. Right. I, right. I, right. I, yeah. You were you were like carrying on a cry. <laughs> <laughs> You were singing in concert with a grand tradition. I mean, it was a little mixed up because it was like half new wave, half punk rock and a lot of prints. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's style. You know, you're like taking specific references and you're like blending them together. How does anyone make art? How does anyone make style? It's like a series of references and a vision board and then you copy it and you, you know, fail in a couple ways. And that's how you make it yours, you know, rather than just what's this, what's this, what's this? <laughs> Okay, so did you carry that fashion sense into college? And you studied at Wesleyan. You mentioned earlier that it was in part because they had an NPR affiliate as a campus radio. So that was part of your decision making. You're already clearly deeply invested in and supported by radio community. But you studied literature and German. So make all this make sense for me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, I definitely was like, I'm in this for the radio station. I don't know. The vibes there were really nice in Middletown, Connecticut. I remember I listened to the radio station before I ever went there. And I was like, this is cool. This is interesting. They're like a public radio station and they're a service. But they're also a wacky college radio station, you know, with like kids grumbling into the microphone and like fumbling over their records and not really knowing how to use the players like this rules. I love all this. I love that. <laughs> and they just like an amazing cast of characters at the radio station. There was like a show that was hosted. I think it's still on called Reasonably Catholic, hosted by a nun. Their most famous one is hosted by this guy, Commander Alien, and it's all about like being an alien on planet Earth for real. It was so fun. I don't know. I just aspired to be a well-rounded person. I think the th- the phrase I used with a friend was like, I would like to be in on the joke. If someone makes a reference, I would like to know what they are talking about. <laughs> and so I did this program where we basically read the Western canon, but we did it really quickly. It was it was a little unrealistic. They'd be like, okay, this week we're reading the Bible. Did you finish it? Okay, now we're moving on to Dante. Honestly, I like skimmed a lot of it, but it did definitely get me in on the joke. And I think that's also part of why I wanted to learn German and like read German. I was like, I would like to feel like I understand this history of philosophy and literature. And also my grandmother grew up in Germany and fled during World War II. I had always been curious about that part of her past. And I was like, maybe if I learn German, you know, and like go to Germany, she'll open up. She did not, but we bonded in that way. I mean, honestly, it's interesting. In college, I stopped dressing quite so wild, but it wasn't because I was like, aha, I have found my people. Actually, quite the quite the opposite in a weird way. There was this website on the campus called the Anonymous Confession Board where people could write whatever they wanted about other people. And people just kept writing about what a bitch I was. Granted, in their defense, I was dressed ridiculously. I remember I showed up on the first day wearing like a gold lame mini dress with like a fur stole, just like, who is this, you know? Not, again, colorless green ideas sleep furiously, just like obnoxious. And so people are talking about how obnoxious I must apparently be. And it made me, I was like, oh, that's not what I was trying to do at all. I just thought I was having fun. I was like, I have to be a little more careful with my messaging. And I remember I like cried and went to Goodwill and bought a bunch of black shirts and black dresses and was like, okay, I'm going to stop letting my clothes speak for me and I'm going to try to speak for me now. And I honestly didn't really pick it back up again until my late 20s. So that is a really interesting experience where you realized that your message was being misinterpreted. Yeah. It was getting away from you. Yeah, The story was getting out of your hands. Exactly. I mean, that message board in a way like helped reflect back to you how people were interpreting who you might be based on your clothing choices, which is sort of ridiculous. And yet it is kind of a mirror of society. Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing, right? Because I, you know, while I wish I could have been the person who would be like, screw you, I'm gonna do me, I don't even care. I mean, I'm not I really believe in like that Marshall McLuhan was onto something and to really communicate, you have to like consider the recipient and the and the receiver. I wanted to make sure my message was coming across and it really helped me rethink what fashion is for. So it sounds like you made kind of a very intentional course correction. Yeah. 
Did you notice right away, like how long until you started to feel like people were not feeling so alienated by your bold choices? I was pretty oblivious in the first place. If it wasn't for the anonymous confession board, I like wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> God, that must have been so hurtful, though. <laughs> oh, like... it, thank you. It really was, actually. It really, it really, it really messed with me. But you know, it's like good practice for living on the internet. I don't know. I noticed a difference in the way people approached me then. I didn't like toss all my clothes. You know, I still tried to wear like fun things sometimes. I just wasn't quite so OTT as I once was. So it's not like I totally was like back to nothing. I just decided to, you know, like only wear ridiculous things when I'm wearing a costume. But I have realized, I mean, this is is such a cliche, but what tremendous power it has in attracting the kind of people you want to be around you. Actually, a lot of my best friends who who work with me in radio, I met them because they were wearing something really intriguing or really interesting. And you go up and talk to them and they turn out to be like an interesting and intriguing person. Isn't that so fun? <laughs> it's the best. It's the and it best. Gives you, it's an invitation. It does give you an opening too, because it's easy to say, oh my God, I love, I love this right. thing. What is it? Where'd you get it? Is it, you know current or vintage or right right and that gets and it gets so unfairly maligned as small talk to be like cute shoes where do you get them but really when you ask that question what you're talking about is what are your consumption habits you know what what's the story behind what you wear and and why you wear it and i have this little pet theory that everything that was considered small talk is no longer small talk. Like talking about clothes is a huge deal and it actually matters a lot. And now like talking about the weather is not (laughs) something small anymore. (laughs) So I don't know if I saw a change right away, but I think slowly over time, especially as I like left school and started to enter larger worlds and live in cities, just reacclimated to the messages that they can actually send and how potent they are and how you actually kind of want to be careful about what you're projecting and who you're projecting to. Okay, sidebar, we don't have to go way into it, but does this also mean you did like the costume holidays? <laughs> like Halloween and things like that? Did you like assuming a character or that kind of dressing up? I'm actually not the biggest fan. I would go all out in college, but I don't believe in one time wear. I don't like buying disposable things. I'm not very good with the idea of having like a special costume for a a special reason. I wish I were. I think Vanessa Friedman had this great article a while ago that was like, just buy a really great black high collared, puffy sleeved Victorian looking dress and just be a really authentic witch every year. And I was like, that's a fantastic idea. I would love to have just like one really high quality Halloween costume that I wear every year, but I've yet to go invest in that. You know when you go to a show and the the person, like the bouncer or the person taking your ticket is wearing a yellow windbreaker that says security on it? You have one of those? I bought one of those and a <laughs> fake mustache and a mag light. <laughs> and now whenever I want to, I can be a security guard oh, that's for fantastic. Halloween. that's <laughs> fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, see, I just need to find like a good old standby. And then you can like stand at the door and say, if you don't have a wristband, you're not getting in here. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, that's so fun. Oh, that is so fun. I will say... The best kind of costume is a sort of like participatory costume like that. A long time ago, um, an ex and I dressed as uh, waiters from Party Down. It's about a catering crew. And so we wore these like catering outfits and we had trays of candy that we like passed out to people. You know, it felt like wearing a costume, but also being part of the party, like play acting like you were. Yeah, like you totally. belong there, which is totally what you can do with the security guard thing, too. That's like very fun. So after college, how did you get started professionally? You went straight into radio, didn't you? I mean, in hindsight, it looks that way. It did not feel that way. Back in my day, to really sound like an elder millennial, like really before podcasting blew up, if you wanted to work in radio, you either had to work at a big station in a city, you know, like WNYC or... KPCC or WBUR or WBEZ. Like basically you work for one of the regional stations or you work at like a tiny little station and sort of work your way back to a bigger station if that's where you want to go. Or you try to go right to the mothership. You try to get in to NPR in DC. And every summer in college, 
I applied to internships at NPR and I always got rejected. And then my senior year, I applied to this very weird internship at NPR that no longer exists. NPR had this one terrestrial radio station in Germany. And it just so happens that because I studied German, I had a competitive edge, even though it was not based in Germany, it was based in DC. And it was really weird. I mean, we basically just like cut up promos for fresh air and, you know, NPR shows but announce the times that they would be on on the German station. You know, even it was an English language station, but it was all around like German timing. And we'd like look up the weather on weather.com in Germany and like read it over the air of like what the weather was. It was so weird. And so I finally got this internship. It was the first time NPR ever paid their interns, which was like a huge, incredible deal at the time. I mean, I remember on the first day they were like, congratulations, NPR intern class, this admissions process is more rigorous than Harvard. And I remember they were like, we're going to go around and we're going to say where everyone went to school. And I remember the first person got up and was like, hi, I went to Harvard. I was like, this is crazy. Where am I? And it felt like battle royale. It was like, there were like 20 of us and we were all trying to see who would be able to last, who would make it out of this internship to become a temp and like maybe one day get a job at NPR. It was not me. I did not do a very good job at my internship. In fact, I was like horrible at it in all these embarrassing ways. Like, wait, what? How, <laughs> what were and your it, shortcomings? Oh, oh my God. If, I could not even begin to tell you all the ways I messed up in my like early radio career. But okay, this is one of the more mortifying points. So it turned out like part of my job was to cut up these American shows so that they could go out on the German radio station. And sometimes I'd have to like edit them or arrange them in a different order using the software. And it turns out I had done the math completely wrong because one day my supervisor comes to me and he's like, Avery, do you know there's been five minutes of silence <gasps> on the air in the middle of the day for the past week or two weeks? Oh, and I was no. like, oh no, oh no, because that's awful. You know, if you have dead air, that's, you know, you don't want that on the radio ever. People are going to think their radios are broken. And so apparently all the German listeners were writing into NPR to complain. And I had just like done the math wrong. He, he, I remember my supervisor was like, you know, there are 60 minutes in an hour. And for some reason, I was doing all the math out of 100 for like no good reason. Just like dumb. Oh, it's dumb. just a rookie mistake. It could happen to anyone. No, people know how time works. I'm like uniquely bad at math. I'm very, <laughs> very, very bad at math. And I remember burying my head in my in my hands and being like, Oh, my God, I'm never gonna work in radio. I was not a good producer. I didn't get to stay. And I remember leaving NPR and being like, wow, that was my chance. And I blew it. Like I worked so hard to try to get to this point and I did not do a good job. And I applied to all these other jobs and all these internships and I got rejected from all of them. Some of them I would make it to like the interview phase and I would get rejected. And then there was this listing for a internship at 99% Invisible. And I was really into podcasts, but it always felt like this underground thing. I'd actually gotten into podcasts while I was at Wesleyan because I was president of the radio station my senior year, and I got really into inviting alumni who had gone on to work in radio to like come back to campus and speak. And they were so kind. I like didn't pay them any money. I was just like, please come come speak to me and other other people. And I remember uh, Lynn Levy, who at the time worked for Radio Lab, and we we're like, wow, she was like a god. Whoa. Um, she she was the one who was like, you guys should check out podcasts. There's this great show called Love and Radio. And that sent me down this rabbit hole of listening to podcasts. And it felt like zines at the time. It felt really... Yeah, Love and Radio was also really, like, mind-blowing for me. Totally, like, yes! So good. And it kind of blew it right wide open because it had so much artistry and also so much emotional resonance. And it was gritty and real and yet artfully crafted. So good. Totally. And there was, like, this one episode where the main... Producer Nick Vanderkolk like gets a gun pulled on him by an interviewee. It was bananas. It was like the first time I read Howl, and I was like, poetry can do this. This is so <laughs> cool. And so, ninety nine percent invisible is in there as one of these like weird indie shows doing all this experimental stuff. So I was a fan. A friend of mine who I worked on the college radio station with had a pact with me where every time we'd find a job listing, an internship listing, anything, we'd send it to each other and we'd both apply. And he found this internship listing for 99% Invisible. And I was like, oh, last thing I need is another intern. I keep, you know, I'm like forever the intern, never the hire. I need to make money so I can live. But it was based in Oakland and my aunt lives in San Francisco. And I was like, you know what? 
I'll just apply. I remember I applied at midnight the night it was due because I was like, well, they're on, they're in California. You know, I've got like three <laughs> hours and then I got it. And I wasn't even I didn't even know how long it was going to be. I moved to California with a duffel bag and the internship got stretched. It was like three months and then six months. And then they were like, I guess you work here. So and then I worked there for seven years and it was the greatest experience of my life. <laughs> I was going to ask you, that must have been so foundational. Oh, um, my God. Yes. Yeah. So seven years as first an intern, but then a, a producer working alongside Roman Mars on such an exceptional trailblazing, like field elevating show. Oh, Hats yeah. off to both of you for that. Oh, thank you. I'm really curious because... You were there for seven years. You made major contributions to that show. You're on mic, you're a producer, you're crafting the stories. So your contribution is very evident. Maybe I'm romanticizing or glamorizing, but I'm hoping that it's a good one. So yeah, I was a huge fan. And I remember, I mean, I still feel this way. Honestly, when Roman calls me, I'm like, oh my God, Roman Mars is calling me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm still such a fan. Can you tell him I said hi? I will. <laughs> no, he's, he's the best. He remains like an incredible mentor to me. I don't have enough amazing things to say about Roman. Yeah, basically, you know, when they started, they were so scrappy. We were in the corner of an architecture firm and we did not have a recording studio. We had a closet. And sometimes we'd have to wait for the architects to like finish their meeting so that we could go in there. And there was one other full-time producer, Roman and me, the intern. And I was there when they decided to go weekly, which I had no idea was like the plan. And doing a weekly show, the way I put it is like, okay, you plan ahead. Week one is great. Week two, you know, you got something in your back pocket. Week three, you're great. And then week four, you're like, ah, uh, shit. Like we don't... Yeah. <laughs> We don't have anything week four. It's just that you just reach these cycles where you're like, oh, those were all our stories. What do we do? And so I found myself in the position. And again, like I had gotten rejected from NPR. I was really hungry. And I was like, if I don't make this work, I don't think I'm going to make anything work. And so I specialized in just filling in the blanks. They'd be like, Avery, do you have a story? I'd be like, yeah, sure. I'll go find one. And I would just <laughs> go like make one because we were so scrappy no one was like, you're not ready yet. Or like, this is how you use a soundboard. They're like, shit, go make it. Like, now, yeah. now, now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like making all kinds of mistakes and fumbling along. Everything was like lovingly edited. And I had so much care. But I wouldn't say I had the most support because they, again, we were like three people trying to make this weekly show, this like heavily produced show. So it was really cool. You're not spending a whole lot on overhead because you don't have a recording studio and you're in the corner of an architecture firm. Yeah. But what's the relationship there? And how did the architecture firm be like, sure, make a podcast here. It won't get in our way. And second of all, who's funding this? Because Weekly is like, and three full-time employees, that's not cheap either. Well, the architecture firm, they were just fans. Roman had sent on Twitter, like, does anyone have extra office space? They were so amazing. Their name is ArcSign. They were like the sweetest people in the world. And they had a corner. They they had a lot of people. They did not have a lot of space. And they let us stay in a corner. But the thing that was so funny is they would always, oh, it was like funny and heartbreaking. They would always try to show us off to clients. You know, like clients would come in and they'd be like, you know the show 99% Invisible? They live in our office. And inevitably, every single time the client would be like, nah. You know, this is in the era where you'd ask people like, do you know what a podcast is? And they would say no. And <laughs> For most of the time, I was like, God, what am I even doing? You know, I felt so embarrassed. I remember people would ask me what I'm up to, and I'd be like, I'm a podcaster. It was like, <laughs> I was mortified. I was like, it's really cool, you guys. Like, no one knows how, how cool it is. Roman is a master at doing these Kickstarter campaigns. So he had a really successful Kickstarter campaign. And, you know, he was like starting a small business. So he didn't initially take a salary. He would do speaking gigs and travel a lot and pay himself from that. It was super scrappy. But it's really interesting because it taught me a lot of people who record on the radio get coached. Like that's very standard for at least for Radio Lab. Like if someone is reading something, there's a producer in the studio coaching them or being like, do it again, try it this way. And I just never had that because we didn't have a studio and we didn't have the resources <laughs> to do that. They were just like, go record, like, just read your thing. And hey, so, get in the closet, read the script. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the, it's so funny. Like, I'm, I'm actually the voice. If you listen to anything that was produced by PRX, you hear my voice at the end. And I go from PRX. And that was recorded when I was like 22 in this closet 
in this <laughs> in this architecture firm. It was so scrappy and it was cool. And it also really prepared me for COVID because I was like, yeah, all right, this is like what I'm used to. Like back into the closet where I belong, you know, back to the scrappy, bootstrappy, make it happen recording. I don't know if you find it fun, but I find it very fun. Well, that's all I've ever been in the podcasting world. It's pretty scrappy still. But that's great. That's really fantastic. I just think that's the dream of what podcasting can be is almost like this pirate radio thing. I don't want it to get too professionalized. After a long time working in TV, I remember developing like almost like eczema or a rash to like these hosted personalities, yeah. you know, like these very newscastery type deliveries. I don't know, you just tune them out so fast because that you don't connect to the human who's delivering yes, the, yes, the yes, words. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. And podcasting for me felt so liberating to just sink into a conversation and not watch the clock and not have somebody saying, you know, say that again, or we need this at 64 seconds and you're running a second long. And so yeah, there's a lot of freedom in it for sure. Oh, there's times I wish I had more support, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's the nature. It is the nature. I mean, that's the funny thing, right? Like as 99 PI expanded, I remember we always felt like we were behind, you know, we were always like, if we only had a little more help. And it was nice to be like, yeah, that feeling is <laughs> never gonna go away. <laughs> yeah. Like no matter how well funded you are, it's always like, no, oh, you're always just gonna have holes in your programming, you're always gonna feel strapped. So 99PI is an interesting story, though. So from 2013, when you joined them, to 2020, like they went on a pretty nice, steep uphill trajectory. What was it like to be in the rocket? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. I kind of didn't real. I was so in the rocket that I didn't know exactly what was happening around me. Like when I entered the rocket, I love this metaphor. When I entered the rocket, everyone was like, what's a podcast? And I was so embarrassed. It made itself known in little ways. You know, we eventually got our own office. There was more of a budget. We could like buy more books. We could travel. We had more time to do stories. I was like, oh, this is cool. But I didn't quite realize what it was until I was on a reporting trip in London. And I remember I got in a cab and the cabbie in London was listening to 99% Invisible. And I was like, whoa, I, that's my job. I work for that show. And they were like, oh my God, are you Avery Truffleman? <gasps> and that was so weird, which says just as much about 99PI as it does about just the nature of podcasting. I really did not know how popular and how widespread and how mainstream it had become. I mean, almost until I left it, really, I didn't realize how big it was. Okay, so you didn't really recognize that, like, the, the earth was receding behind you and you were shooting into space. <laughs> But that must have been a wild experience to be voice recognized in a cab. It was wild. At that point, too, are you also feeling like solid and confident in your craft? You, I mean, that's one of the benefits of starting with something that's so scrappy and yet so highly produced is that everybody's performing every role. You see how everything's done. You're intimate with how the stories get constructed and what works and what doesn't and how the decisions get made. Seven years into it, you must have felt like you had chops. I think by the end, I sort of felt like I did. But you know, the other thing is like, I grew up with it. I started when I was 22. And I ended when I was 29. My voice changed, which is an interesting thing that happens with everyone's voices. Actually, if you listen to old episodes of 99pi, like Roman's voice is so much higher. And it kind of deepens as it settles into its comfort. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's really interesting. And so Ira Glass has this famous thing that he says where he was like, anyone who gets into something, they choose to do it because they have excellent taste. Like maybe you love listening to music, so you decide you're going to be a musician. Or you love furniture, so you decide you're going to make furniture. Or you love podcasting, so you decide you're going to make podcasting. But because you have such good taste and because you're such a fan, you know enough to know that the stuff you are initially making is not good. Like your work does not align with your own standards, which is so uniquely painful. Yes, and it was, is. It really is, especially when you're like, I hate this. This is this is not good. Especially when it's like out there in the world for public consumption. So I was like very mortified most of the time. Like I would say for the first five years of working at 99% Invisible, I was just like perpetually mortified all the time. And if someone was like, I heard you on the radio, I'd like blah, bury my head in my hands. It's so I, I'm like so a little mortified, but I'm not as mortified because 
Ira Glass says the only way to bridge the taste gap is to just keep making things. That's the only thing you can do. You just got to like make a lot of bad work and keep going. And one day you'll be able to stand by what you actually make and you'll get to the point where your own work aligns with your own tastes. And I remember one time Ira Glass was in town and Roman was like doing an introduction for him. So I got to meet him and ugh, this is so embarrassing, but I ran up to him and I was like, Ira, you know, when will the taste gap close? And he looked at me <laughs> and he was like, how old are you? And he was like, what are you doing now? And he like took in a bunch of inputs and then he just looked me dead in the eye like a taste gap tabulator. And he looked me dead in the eye and he was like 27. I was like, okay. And it kind of happened. I mean, I think I'm still learning. I don't think I've quite made work that lives up to the work that I want to make yet. But I think I started to feel not completely mortified at 27. And that was how old I was when Articles of Interest came out. And it felt like my graduate school project, you know, after five years of 99PI, I wanted to explore and experiment a little bit more. So I did this spinoff series about fashion and then I did it again in 2020. Yes. Yeah, so we have two series now. So if, if, for our listeners, if you haven't listened to Articles of Interest, there are many episodes you can go back and listen to. And they're deep dives on movements and articles of clothing in ways that are, are crafted that align you with the backstory as well as the importance, like the cultural relevance and how it's impacted society. It's, they're pretty great. Oh, thank you. I remember when that series came out, just feeling the part of me that really high fives anyone who's making really quality media around design was high fiving you for oh, <laughs> so <thank> hard. You. <laughs> because I feel like so many people get it wrong or they flatten it or they cheapen it in some way. And to see articles of interest kind of come out of the 99PI studio and be of your own personality, but of, of the same kind of caliber. I'm just, I'm so happy that it exists. And I hope that it's something that, you know, you, you'll keep working on whenever you have the opportunity to, because I think it's a great series. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking all those in-depth questions about where I came from. Like now it seems obvious that I've always had this burning desire to like explore more about clothes and be like, what's up with that? Why do these things have power? These are design stories. They belong in a design podcast. So yeah, it was really like the merging of my, my two passions. I'm so amazed that Roman like let me do this. I mean, I wouldn't say like completely carte blanche, but like a lot, a lot of trust. He like really just let me do my own thing and it was incredible. Oh, that's so great. I'm happy to hear that. And then how did Nice Try come about? Tell our listeners about Nice Try. Okay, so uh, Nice Try actually just sort of landed in my lap. After I did Articles of Interest, I got an email from Curbed, which was one of my favorite design websites. And they were like, hey, we want to do a podcast about utopian experiments. I was like, totally sounds up my alley. I would love to do that. And it was interesting, though, because like with Articles of Interest, I made it almost entirely by myself not entirely by myself. The whole team at 99% Invisible would listen to episodes and offer edits. And I worked with a musician, a sound engineer, but more or less like everything else was just like a solo thing. And so it was really interesting with Nice Try. It was my first time being just sort of a host. You know, I did all the interviews, but I wasn't in Pro Tools, like chopping them up the way I, I normally would. And someone else was like booking the interviews for me, which was bananas. Oh, that's got to feel kind of like I've arrived. And also like, this is weird. It's out of my control. Exactly. That was my reaction. I was like, oh, I'm not controlling this. Like, it's not <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what the music was going to sound like. I didn't know where it was going to play. So it actually made me like really nervous. But it was very fun. It was like a nice experimental break in, in what I would normally do in terms of like learning about utopian experiments, which is something that I can't say I ever had interest in before, but I'm really glad they brought it to me. I would have never thought of this myself. It's such a good idea. Yeah. And it seems like one of those jobs that might come find you that does utilize your strengths, but also presents an opportunity for your own edification in the process. And, you know, I can imagine your future as a podcaster, there's going to be a lot of work that is created and all the heavy lifting is done by you. And then a few nice projects where you're plugged into the equation and you get to work with other people who have ideas about how the project should come together and you get to be more of a collaborator or more of a contributor. Yeah, totally. And like the team at Curbed is so incredible. It's a super lucky combination. But then, of course, 
we did Nice Try again last year. And this time I was like making a lot of the music myself, and like way, way too invested this time. And I was like <laughs> doing all the interview, like way 10 times more hands on this time than I was last time because I was like, I, I don't want to do anything again if I'm not involved in every single step of the process. That might be maladaptive. I don't know. It's the way I have I am now. Maybe it'll change. But no, it's not it's not a very sustainable way to be. <laughs> Maybe I should get over it, but I'm I'm very into like if if my name is on it and my voice is on it, it has to reflect me. And I think I that comes from working for 99PI for so long. No, I long. think that's a strong instinct. But I mean, it also, I don't know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I think it was just because I enjoy, I would like edited and produced other people. But the stories that I put my voice and name on, I was really invested in. And I always wanted to keep that. That makes me want to ask you about, you did another stint as as a host of The Cut, which yeah. is a podcast, a weekly podcast for New York Magazine. Yeah, I think it was a reaction to that, honestly, because like, it was a huge challenge to make a podcast every week during 2020. It was so hard to like even yeah. come up with things to say. And also we were sort of figuring out how podcasting worked. And I think a lot of it was just the cut was one of my favorite publications and they had had a podcast before that was one of my favorite podcasts but now we were all in isolation and I wasn't in the same room as all of them and so I was kind of like I'm supposed to be representing this magazine but what is the cut I feel so far away from from everyone which is no one's fault but the pandemic and as a host you're you're sort of also not being utilized for all that you are right you're you're being utilized for your sort of quick thinking and your personality and your savviness on mic. Well, I think it was that I was supposed to represent this other publication that mm -hmm. I was like trying to interpret and it I wasn't I was conspicuously not trying to be me too much. But then at the same time, working on a weekly schedule, and it was a really small team. At one point, it was just me and one other person. And so we were still like cutting the whole thing together ourselves. It was a super small team. And sometimes, you know, if you had to get a story out this week and no one was getting back to you, the easiest thing to do would be like, well, I guess I'll make it a personal story. I guess I'll make it about me. So it was simultaneously like m the most personal work I've ever done and the least personal work I've ever done. That's discordant. <laughs> it was a little discordant. And again, you know, it's all like weird pandemic timing. And I think the other thing is like, there were a lot of people who had to oversee it. Everything had to be run by the powers that be. And I think it left me feeling a bit confused about my own voice and my own role. And I think that's why I went full throttle on Nice Try. And I was like, this is gonna be like a manifestation of everything I've ever read and done and thought. And so maybe I'll calm it down in the future. But it was definitely a bit of a, a pendulum swing. That I mean, that makes perfect sense to me now that you sort of ex spelled out the contextual background. And also, during the pandemic, I leaned 175% into my work. Yeah, exactly. Because I felt like it was the only thing I had of substance to offer a world that was falling apart. You know, when you send your voice out there to keep people company or to inform them or to provide them some sort of solace, you, you, you start to feel like that's your public service. Yeah, we're back to public service again. And when everybody was feeling so isolated, I was feeling more than ever that I just wanted to keep putting things out for people to something to hold on to. But at the same time, right, there were there would be these weeks. I mean, I wonder if you felt this way, too. I was like, man, I don't I don't know how much I remember going back and forth being like, does everyone want to talk about what's going on? Or do people not want to talk about what's going on? Is it weirder to talk about it or to not talk about it? And I really wrestled with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was both. And it was also happening internally, right? right. Like, there were some days where like, I was like, I need to commiserate with somebody. And then there were other days where I was like, I need a distraction. And I need somebody to tell a story <laughs> that helps me believe that it's going to be okay. I definitely waffled between the two and kind of gave myself permission to do that, thinking that other people were probably feeling the same way. Yeah. And I mean, in a weird way, it's good that you did. I mean, maybe one day we'll look back at these like pandemic chronicles as a little time capsule. But yeah, I don't know. So a lot of our listeners work in the creative fields. 
but I don't know how many of them, I actually don't have an idea of how many of them work in audio. So can you give us a, just a, a broad overview of what your creative process looks like? You've definitely worn all the hats, producer, creator, writer, reporter, talent, and I'm sure a fair amount of entrepreneurial hustling. Oh, barely. No, really, that's, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm like uniquely bad at business, like almost as bad at business as I am at numbers. <laughs> Honest, that's so funny that you say that. I'm like, well, I always joke like, well, we're all once and future podcasters here, aren't we? I just think it's like so many podcasters out there and it's great, like fantastic. I hope I hope a lot of your listeners are audio people or if they're considering audio that they'll actually try their hand at it. Hey, yeah, actually, if you're listening, tweet us. Let us know if you're into audio. <laughs> I'd love a sense of how many of our listeners are making audio projects. But I feel like what I do is so specific, honestly, Amy, like, I don't even know if it's what listeners want right now, because I came up in the world, you know, when 99% Invisible was starting, we based our idea of what we were making more or less around the commute, you know, it's like 30 minutes long, you get some good facts, it ties up with a bow, you sort of like concentrate so that you don't have to listen to the fellow train riders or the traffic around you. And now I think that people are commuting less or they're commuting differently. The nature of listening has changed. And I think people are interested in more, almost stuff that feels more like talk radio, things that are longer, maybe a little shaggier, maybe you can like tune in and out because they're not necessarily cold focusing while they're commuting. They're probably like listening at home while they do the dishes or clean or putz around. For every story I do, I talk to at least eight people, you know, and I like read all their books and I do a ton of research. I try to weave them together as these like complicated, surprising stories. And I'm probably not going to stop doing that because I don't know any other way. But I only bring this up. I don't I don't say this to sound self-deprecating. I think there is a tremendous appetite for just two people talking for like really good conversation right now. And I think that's the, the core of what makes good audio. I feel like the two most important things are like, do the reading and do the research so that you can have a knowledgeable, informed conversation, which I'm so honored, Amy. Like, it's the greatest gift you can give someone. Like, thank you for your research and your and your time. It's like an amazing gift. You you help other people open up. Like, you do the work for them, and then they'll do the work for you. It's really beautiful. Thank you for that. Oh, no, thank you. And then the other thing I would say is, like, please, for the love of God, use like a decent microphone. It doesn't have to be a good one, just like an external microphone. But then the thing that you do, if you're going to edit it, which, you know, I think that's a very merciful thing to do for the sake of your listeners. That doesn't even have to be, you know, if you edit on like Audacity or GarageBand or whatever, the, the, the best tip is to record 30 seconds of silence, just the sound of the room so that you can splice things together. And then it doesn't sound, you know, like if you were to chop me off just a chop, it'd be like, Hoop like all the air and the sound would go out of the room. It would like cut to this weird silence. Mm -hmm. But if you want to make a nice edit, you like take some of that silence you recorded and like place it in the middle. We called that room tone in the TV businesses. It is. Yes, yes. Room tone. Yeah. Yeah. One time I interviewed Rebecca Solnit and I was like, we're just going to collect like 30 seconds of room tone right now. And she's like, hmm room tone like a pantone color wheel i think about that all the time (laughs) like what color is your room yes room tone okay so you you know this but i guess for listeners just you know collect the room tone and i also like as a designer who thinks about space i just find that so interesting that every room has its own tone yes 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 and i mean some people will even be like you know, unplug the refrigerator, like make sure the room is as silent as possible. But I don't know. I think as long as you've got room tone and it's not obscenely noisy, you can get away with a lot. But like, how do you construct the story? Like what's the writing process like for you? Oh man. Well, the writing process for me, it's funny. A huge part of it is like going to parties, which I obviously can't do right now. But I think because it is a conversation-based medium, it is rooted in conversation. I always am practicing telling the story to people. And by practicing, I mean, pulling someone aside and being like, hey, can I tell you what I'm working on? Like, I have no (laughs) chill. If someone's like, what's up, Avery? I'm like, well, do you want to learn about crockpots? And I'll just like (laughs) practice the story because that's the way to, to see how you naturally speak and how you naturally 
tell the story and when you're in front of someone you can gauge like oh this is where they're interested this is where they're not interested and then who knows I'm losing, might be them. Like, I'm losing them <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and you're like wait 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 no 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 like here's the cool thing yeah. and then uh, or they'll, they'll be like I don't understand and it's it's a useful way to make sure that what you're saying over the radio actually reflects real life by like practicing saying it to a bunch of different kinds of people and then also when you practice saying it to people you never know who's going to be like oh by the way like my uncle is an avid crockpot collector or like invented the crockpot. So I, a huge part of my process is telling my stories to people or like talking about what I'm researching and what I'm thinking about while I'm doing it and really marinating in it. And then, so honestly, the researching process and the interview process is way more long and fraught to me than the writing process. Because by the time I sit down to write, I've like told it so many times, I kind of just... You're just transcribing what you would say out loud. Yeah, basically. It's just like, la, 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 la. Not to say that it's all like fun and easy. Then it gets, you know, that first draft is awful and then it gets edited. But that's sort of how it works for me. I think to, to sound like a conversation, it has to be based in conversation. I love that you shared that. that I wasn't expecting to hear that, but it makes perfect sense oh. that so much of your creative process, it's almost like... I hear com- comedians talk about how they work yes. out material too. It's it's like that. Like you, you tell the story. You figure out where people lose interest. You figure out where the interesting parts are. What people react to. What order it needs to go in. What's the right pacing? Yes, exactly. Which words people don't understand and might need a little extra contextual information. I'm totally. so glad you said that. And that's also another thing. I always say it goes. My research process is like parties then books. Like you talk to people and they'll recommend movies to watch or books to read. Well, not right now. Now it's really hard. (laughs) Parties and books in a gold lame pixie dress. Oh my God. Oh man, we would have gotten along great when I was (laughs) a freshman. (laughs) No, but really like the other day, I don't know. I just love getting coffee with people and having walks with people. And sometimes I'm like, man, do I just fritter my whole day away like socializing? But that's really where I get so many of my sources like finding out what people are interested in what they're reading and then absorbing it from there so i think yeah it's a people-based medium and it has to be rooted in conversation brilliant it makes perfect sense but when you spell it out like that it's it's also like well wait why didn't i think of that (laughs) so before i wrap this up you've been so transparent with like your process i'm hoping you'll be just as transparent with your personal life I like to ask people about their personal life, not just strictly to pry, but I really believe in celebrating the whole person. And I know that that. you exist, you know, in many multitudes outside of work and... Well, like barely. (laughs) (laughs) Well, lately it's hard. Like we're all weirded out and distorted versions of ourselves. I mean, I think I have a sense of there's a standard of quality that comes through in your work. There's an interest in design and fashion. There's like a deeply historical lens that you frequently tell your stories in, which I think goes back to your literature. And you definitely don't tell stories that have like short shelf lives. Oh, thank you. So I'm wondering what that looks like in your personal life. Like, what do you do for joy? And where do you find meaning? And who are the people that accompany you on these excursions? Oh, man. I mean, I still feel like I'm sort of rebuilding my life now because I moved to New York during the pandemic. Oh, I moved to Providence during the pandemic. Really? And I don't, yeah. From where? From Los Angeles. I lived oh, in Los Angeles whoa. for 20 years. Whoa. And, yeah. It's weird. You know how it feels. Like I had this whole world and my whole life and like the way I lived in Oakland. And it was always like biking around, hanging out at my favorite bookstore. And yeah, there was this one bar that I would just go to and everybody I knew would be there. It was like this little lovely community. I love Oakland, by the way. It's got so much flavor. It's so great. Such good food, such interesting pockets of people and... Such a nice mix. And oh, yeah. it kind of felt like there are parts of it that felt kind of like Detroit, which is where I grew up. It felt like home for me. Uh, totally. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I remember, you know, bringing people who were visiting, you know, I, and I loved my spot. The 99% Invisible office was downtown. And that was just where I lived. And, you know, downtown looks ugly. It looks like there's not a lot going on. But you just, like, turn down the side streets. You, like, got to know where to go. And it's just... <laughs> Like, it's thriving. It was so alive. It was so fun. 
and like whatever downtown's already changed so much even during the pandemic one day i'll go back but i'm a little scared of it i feel like way too sentimental about oakland but, yeah it might be too soon it's yeah. like the scab needs to heal a little bit more exactly so yeah that's the thing i'm just like who am i in new york and right now i mean i hang out with my sister a lot i see my parents a lot i hang out with my boyfriend a lot i have like two best friends from college and so i have this like little world Honestly, like what brings me joy? I'm still sort of trying to remember that. I'm like trying to remember how to read for pleasure again and yeah. I don't know, take long walks. And I, I wish I could tell you that I had some, I wish I could be like, yeah, I'm a, what's it called when you collect stamps? Oh, there's a word for that? Philatelist. I, I forget. <laughs> they have like a very fun <laughs> phrase. I don't have some like cool secret hobby. I wish I could be like, yeah, I'm into tube and throat singing. But like, I don't know. I'm pretty boring. I think there's been this necessary movement that has happened right now where people are like, you're not your job, which is which is true. But I remember in the Bay Area and even actually in New York, when we were briefly allowed to go to parties, I would go to parties and people would be like, you're not allowed to talk about work. I don't think that's actually the right response. I mean, I think that was a pendulum swing that had to happen. And I think we needed to like step back and realize that life wasn't only about work, especially like exploitative mistreatment. But I hope that there can be a sort of middle ground or a new era about valuing work instead. And I don't know, when I look at old WPA murals about like the beauty of labor, that's kind of how I feel. I like, I love my work and I'm proud of it. And I don't think it defines all of who I am, but it's like such a joy. I'm so lucky. I feel so, so, I keep using the word blessed, which makes me sound weirdly, I'm not evangelical or anything. I don't know. I'm just so grateful that I get to do this. And it's so fun to talk about and to talk about what other people do for work. I'm with you. What about like if you're really passionate about it? Because the other thing I do is I'm an educator. I teach furniture design and I podcast and that's who I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I don't talk about that, then I can't contribute. I can ask questions. I'm pretty good at that. But I need for that to be part of the conversation because that's what I'm really passionate about. Totally, totally. And I think there are so many things that can be done to like make all forms of work, like, oh my God, especially teaching, to like make <laughs> teaching feel more like valued and production. I do a lot of reading and research about clothing and like, oh my God, not devaluing the labor of making clothes, you know? And I feel like right now the way the economy is set up is like, you don't like your job, get a cool side gig or like get a side hustle or find something else that doesn't matter. It's like, well, why don't instead we make all these jobs interesting and valuable and pay more and worth talking about, which is easier said than done. But yeah, exactly. I think my boyfriend is a film producer and we always joke that like life is work, work is life, but it's like <laughs> not untrue. It's kind of, we get to do what we, what we like to do. We're very lucky. I feel that you feel lucky and I'm, I'm happy for you. And I agree with you. I feel like there's a lot of labor out there in the world that gets devalued. And instead of devaluing it, we could really spend some time and energy creating the conditions yeah. for people to be compensated in a way that makes them feel valued, uh, give them enough ownership to take pride in their work. And then also when we value the labor that goes into our objects, we value the objects more. Yes. You know, yes. it's just all part of creating a world that has a lot more care and intention in it, which is, I think, something we're all craving. That's so beautiful. That's totally what I meant to say. 10,000%. <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> yes. Amen. Well, I appreciate that you're kind of in this also pandemic transition where you're in a new place, but you can't fully settle in yeah. because there are so many limitations. But I'm glad you have your boyfriend and your sister close by. Oh, me too. So what does future Avery look like to you? Do you have a, a dream for the future you can share? Does it feel too vague and blurry because the world is on fire and there's so <laughs> much extreme uncertainty? Oh, here? my God. I feel as old as the hills, Amy, just because like podcasting is so relatively young and I've been around for all of it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> industry veteran. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's funny, sometimes people will be like, what's your end goal here? Like, do you want to write a book? You know, do you want to write for TV? Like, what do you want to do? And the answer is just like, I love audio and I just want to make more of it. This is all I want to do. And this is like, this is the be all end all. This is the end goal. And it's 10 times better than what I could have ever dreamed of when my original plan was, you know, work at a regional station 
in rural Alaska and like slowly try to work my way up to finally be closer to my family. So I don't, I don't know. I hope I can keep doing more of this if that's not too like a Miss America answer. No, I mean, I think when I said at the beginning that it seems like you're in your calling, I think you are. You know, you don't have to know what kind of audio you, you'll be making in the future. That's the beauty of like being a creative. Like you haven't had all your ideas yet. Thank but you. The fact that you feel like you're in the right place is that's wonderful. I feel like I'm in the right place at the wrong time. I really just want to go <laughs> interview people in person again. I'm so bummed about it. It was so fun for like a moment last year. Most of the interviews for Nice Try Season 2 I got to do in person. I was like, oh. I'm back, baby. And now, I don't know. This is lovely. Like remote totally works, but it's not the same. It's not the no. same. <laughs> That's my dream. I want to do in-person interviews. Yes, that's the dream. Okay, can I steal your answer? That's my dream. I want to be doing in-person interviews. Um, Avery, you're you're delightful. Oh, you're, my God, I feel amazing. just the same about you. Thank you so much for all your questions. It's truly the greatest gift. Thank you for, for sharing your story with me and for sharing your, your fashion adventures and your audio <laughs> adventures and even your sort of uncertainty because I think that you know, especially at this time, and you're in a time of transition, uncertainty is something we can all relate to. And it makes me feel less alone, knowing that other people are kind of feeling it too. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. That's also really good to hear. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Avery and her work, read the show notes. Click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app, or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your ratings and reviews really help us connect with other listeners who would love these stories. So thank you. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. 